Hello brothers and sisters of Christ. This uh, series of words to no profit, I've talked about this in the past, about the word rapture, but I wanted to go over it again um, for this series. It's okay to go over some things more than once. Okay? Some brethren believe they put out a video and they're done. I did my video, I'm done. It's okay to preach multiple times on the same subject. Um, so brothers and sisters in Christ, turn to 1 Thessalonians 4.16. But before we get into 1 Thessalonians 4.16, I'm going to go over two times where the, word, where the Bible of proper words are met, the words caught up are used. Okay? But first, rapture. Why is rapture a word to no profit? Well, first of all, you, since you can't find the word rapture, remember our, our, our foundation, brothers and sisters of Christ. Anytime someone says, capital T, Trinity is a title for God, chapter and verse. Rapture, chapter and verse. Whatever, chapter verse. Christmas, chapter and verse. We can agree to disagree, chapter and verse. You can lose your salvation, chapter and verse. Oh, there is no imminent return of Jesus Christ, chapter and verse. We've already proven that's false. And you've had men that over the years that have study after study after study proving that the imminent return of Jesus Christ is truth. You've had men turn on it. I'm getting a little heated because I talked to the Lord about this study before doing this study. Brothers and sisters Christ, I'm getting heated because they, they have the attitude that you can agree to disagree. They have the attitude, oh, a little bit don't hurt. A little bit don't hurt. It's okay to add a word here and there. A little bit don't hurt. When you add to Scripture, brothers and sisters Christ, it's a step in the wrong direction, period. No matter how innocent it looks, no matter how small, it's just a small little word rapture, just a small little word. It's still a step in the wrong direction. Anytime someone tries to add to this book or subtract from this book. Period. Okay? Had a brother in Jeremiah. He didn't like the word workman, so he decided to replace the word workman when it comes to the disagreement. Some of the brethren have a disagreement on Christmas. When it came to the Christmas tree, he, disagree, he, he changed the word workman to craftsman. He didn't like what God said, so he decided he would erase it and put in his own word. And real quick, Brother Sis Christ, I want to say this real quick. Look how deceiving this is. And this is the trick that they use for rapture. Okay, they say the catching away of the body of Christ, caught up. And what does caught up mean? Well, caught up means rapture. Now stop right there. Did they give an actual definition? Or did they replace the word with their own word? Bible says workmen with man's hand with the axe. And Jeremiah talking about how they were turning trees into idols. Okay. Well, you know, that pesky word, I don't like that word workman. Because a workman just means someone who labors. And it actually defines what they're laboring at. Cutting trees down. Okay. So what I'm going to do is say, you know that word workman? That word workman means craftsman. Did they actually give you a definition of the word? A Bible definition? Like, going, okay, laborer, let's compare laboring in the word the Bible talks about, and then laboring, labor. Let's go ahead and do a word study on labor, and let me tell you what labor means according to the Bible, what the Bible definite. No. What did they do? Labor. Well, we're going to say craftsman. That's my definition of labor is craftsman. How many of you guys have seen people do that? They take a word, they replace it with their own word, hiding it under definition. I'm just giving you a definition. No, they're not. And then they give a definition of that word that they replaced God's word with. You know, caught up. What caught up means is rapture. And then people are like, cricket, cricket, cricket. Rapture. You really didn't give a definition. You didn't explain what it was. Oh, well, what rapture means. And then they go in and give their own definition of what rapture means. And then they claim it's, 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 it's part of God's word. It's absolute truth. You see how sneaky that is? How deceptive that is? Now, I'm not going to mention names, but that brother in Christ that did that Christmas, the defending Christmas with Jeremiah, I had a brother come to me and say, I watched his video, and I'm sorry, but I have to agree with him. It's statues and, and this and that. He traded the word decked. He replaced the word decked with gilded. 
When you define the word decked, he didn't define the word decked. He replaced the word decked with gilded. And then he defined what gilded was and said, it's absolute truth. That's what's in Jeremiah. Be careful. But I had a brother come talk to me and I told him. I said, you need to watch it again. I watched it. You need to watch it again. He's replacing words in God's Bible with his own words. And if it said craftsman instead of, of um, laborer, if it said gilded instead of decked, he would be 100% correct. But that's how they're, these people that are trying to pervert the word of God, that's how they're sneaky. Because if they use the words they use, yes, they would be correct. But the sneaky part is, is that's not what God used. That's not the words God chose to use. Brothers and Christ, we're supposed to use the words God chose us to use. We're supposed to be Bible believers. This God's perfect written word, the King James Bible, is supposed to be our foundation in all matters of faith and practice. But people today, they just keep adding little words. Christmas, it's not a big deal. Trinity, not a big deal. Rapture, not a big deal. You know, church is a building, it's not a big deal. They change definitions of words in the Bible. The Bible, like person, the Bible, the, the, the definition of a person in the Bible is you have to have a body, you have to have a soul, and it's always referred to someone who's living. Some people say, well, you're just quoting Webster. I got, a, I got that from the Webster's 28 Dictionary. Sometimes it's right on, sometimes it's not. It's not the final authority. I just didn't grab from the Webster's 28 Dictionary, which I'm going to show you the definition of rapture. I didn't just grab from the Webster's 1828 Dictionary and said, this is absolute truth. I wrote all the definitions for person down, and then I did a word study on person and went through this, and that's a long study, went through this whole Bible with the word person. Every time person is mentioned in the Bible, it's someone that has a body, a soul, and they're living spirit. Remember when they die, they yield up the ghost, they yield up the spirit? King David said, in thy hands I commend, I commend my spirit. He's saying, my life is in your hands, Lord. You can take it at any moment. My life is in your hands. When you say, I can put my spirit in your hands. When the spirit leaves the body, you're dead. You're no longer considered a person. But the Bible definition of person is body, soul, and spirit. And you still, when you show that to brethren, they still want to say God in three persons. God the Father has his own body, soul, and spirit. God the, they say God the Son, but the, once again, when you ask them chapter and verse where it says God the Son, it's not there. God the Son, their lowercase g, God the Son, has a body, soul, and spirit of his own, and the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, they call it, God the Holy Spirit, lowercase g, God, uh, has a body, soul, and spirit of his own. Now, don't get me wrong, I've talked to a lot of brethren that use these false terms because they've weased, Satan has weaseled his way into the Bible-believing movement that even though this doesn't say it, they say it. But when you back people into the corner, that's when you can find out, do they actually believe what this says or the pagan trinity of the Catholic Church? Now, I digress a little bit, but the point is, is where does it end? People say, just me getting on the word rapture, you're just nitpicking, you're just nitpicking. It's a step in the wrong direction. The moment you start adding to God's word, period, it's a step in the wrong direction. And look at what's happened. What's the nature of perversion? When you start perverting God's word by adding to and subtracting from it, what's the nature of it? It gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. It is so bad, I've come across people who say, I believe this book is God's perfect written word, but when they go to speak and all their stands and the type of words they choose to use, they're nowhere near this book. That's how bad it's gotten. They're nowhere near it. Look at all the Bible perversions we have. Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. So, brother, says Christ, you're going to get, if you stand with me, as far as, try, I'm trying, I'm not saying I am, here, real quick, here's the definition. When I say 100% Bible believer, today we have 90% Bible believers, 80% Bible believers, 70%, 50% Bible believers. You say, what is that? That's somebody who says, I believe in this book, but somewhere they have something, some belief, some foundation, where it doesn't line up with Scripture, and they choose that over the Scriptures. You know how you be 100%, I didn't say 100% correct on the Bible, I said, how do you, you know, you want to know how you be a 100% Bible believer? 
someone comes up to you and says, Rapture. Uh, chapter and verse on the word rapture? Well, it's here. Let me, let me show you. It's right here. Please. Wait. Wait. It's not here. You know what? I'm going to do away with rapture. I'm not going to say rapture. What does the Bible, we're going to talk about it. What does the Bible say instead? And I'm going to use that. That's a 100% Bible believer. They could have been saying it wrong in the past. They could have been doing things wrong in the past. But the moment absolute truth from the Word of God comes across them, is shown to them, they're no longer blind, they're no longer ignorant. Do they side with the Bible or do they side with the world? Traditions of men, culture, heritage, church fathers. That's how you can tell when someone's a 100% Bible believer. They always conform to the Word of God when the truth comes out. They might fight it a little bit at first. I almost said always, but in the end, they always conform to God's Word in the end. They might struggle with it. They might fight it a little bit. I've had that story about the Trinity where some guy really went off on me, that testimony, and I just kept preaching truth. I didn't go off on him back. I didn't call him names. I didn't mock him. I wasn't sarcastic. I wasn't spitting on him or kicking dirt on him. I wasn't stabbing him in the back. I wasn't speaking out of bitterness and hate and ego and pride. I just tried to reach him with, in brotherly love for the Word of God, saying chapter, verse, chapter. And he really went off on me and disappeared. Didn't hear from him for months. And then after a while, he came back and said, You know what? You're absolutely right. I'm sorry. In the end, someone who's a 100% Bible believer, it might, they might struggle with it for a while. They might fight traditions of men. They might fight church fathers. They might fight culture. But in the end, someone who's a 100% Bible believer will always submit themselves to this book in the end. Lord, if, I'm, if it's not in the Scriptures, help me get it out of my life. Now, you can say rapture, but help me get it out of my vocabulary when, I apply, when I'm talking about the Word of God. It's not a sin to say rapture. We're going to find out. It's a sin to say rapture is what happens to a saint, a saved sinner, before the time of Jacob's trouble. Then it becomes a sin because you're bringing it and trying to say it has to do with this book, God's perfect written Word, when it's nowhere to be found in this book. That's when it becomes a sin. See, I can teach... The Bible word is caught up, and we call it the catching away when it's multiple people. Caught up is one, catching away is multiple people. We say catching, it's plural. So we say the catch away of the body of Christ, but the Bible word is caught up. We can say caught up or falsely called the rapture. See, I used the word rapture, but I said falsely called, because it is. So let's get into this study real quick again. I'm sorry for the long intro. I'm just, I'm getting frustrated with some of the brethren out there. I love you. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ out there, but I'm getting so frustrated in these last days, the temptation, the perversion has been infiltrating the church where it's okay for us to replace certain words. It's okay for us to hold traditions of men, make the words of the commandments of God of none effect by your traditions, culture, heritage, church fathers. Okay, then you have that whole occult atmosphere where you have people that are respecter of persons. And they're not following Jesus Christ and His Word. They're following that man and His Word. And when His words don't line up with the Bible, they're going to go off His words. They're not going to go off of God's words. I'm of Him. I have to follow Him. And that's what we're fighting today. And it's just... Urgh. It's frustrating trying to deal with some of these people that are cult, cult. They have that occult atmosphere, that cultic atmosphere. Respecter of persons. Yeah, but my person said this, and I'm just going to keep copying and keep parroting PWC, Polly want a cracker, keep parroting what that person said and not yielding to the scriptures. Brother says Christ, I'm not the final authority. The King James Bible is God's final authority. Do you line up with this book? Or are you just parroting what someone else said and they said, if you say what I say, you line up with the book. No, you need to actually line up with the book. Whatever you say, whether it's what they said, if they said something and it lines up, praise God. But this is the final authority. If what they're saying doesn't line up with the scriptures, guess what side you're supposed to choose? It's not, that's not a trick question. Yet today it seems like it. Guess what side you're supposed to choose, brother? It says Christ, the Word of God. 
God's given everybody the Word of God. Today, no, the, I've been, the Lord's been blessing me with sending Bibles overseas to some people who can't order them there, but I can order them here and mail them over. You can pretty much get the Bible almost everywhere. It might get taken away and you have to get another one, but the Word of God is readily available all over the world. Today, men are without excuse. Remember what the Bible says, that this ignorance God winked at? Now, it's talking about the Godhead. It's talking about idols, all these false gods that get brought into this. God's Word, not organized religion, but God's Word, traditions of men, culture, heritage, and church fathers have invited Satanism in, uh, false idols in, false teachings, and they make this way, and at this ignorance God winked at. But now come in at every man everywhere to repent. Instruction, righteousness. God will wink at you when you're ignorant. In other words, He's not going to hold you accountable when you're ignorant. But those of us who truly love God and know His Word, and if you're a babe in Christ, I'm telling you, He loves you. He's not going to leave you ignorant. The Holy Spirit's going to come in and eventually bring you into all truth. All truth. Okay. I gave a good example. I had a plate that had false gods on it. It was sitting there. I got it from, I think it was China or Thailand. Because I've been all over the world. China or Thailand. And it's sitting there and it has these false dogs, the demon dogs that guard the gate. And um, it had paganism on it. And I walked by it a million times. Didn't even think about it. I was ignorant. I didn't even think about it. But there was one time that God had me walk by, and he just the Holy Spirit hit me hard. We were doing some teachings on idols. I walked by, and it just hit me. The, the Holy Spirit hit me, smacked me upside the head, and said, look at that plate, and said, hey, that's wickedness. That's idols. You have false gods in your home. Kind of like invite, uh, uh, cr creating a false god with man's hands, work with man's hands, cutting down a tree, decking it, and bringing it into the home. You have a false idol in your home. Guess what I did? I got rid of the plate. I didn't sell it. I smashed it into pieces and threw it in the garbage so nobody could be deceived by it. Okay? Brother and Sister Christ, what is our final authority? And that's what it comes down to. I really want to stress this because you guys are some, you're gonna have some brethren, maybe in the comment section. Um, although the comment section has been pretty dry in these last days. Um, that I've had attacks where it's not that big of a deal. It's just one word. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that big. It's just one word. Brothers and sisters of Christ, it's a step in the wrong direction. Look where it leads. Look at the mess that we're in today. Okay? Rapture. Webster's 18, because we can't go through the scriptures, because chapter and verse on rapture. I've, to, I've, had, I've come across people where they say, I believe in a rapture. I tell I don't believe in a rapture. Oh, you, you're a posty toasty you're a post-trib or mid-trib. I said, no. I believe the body of Christ gets caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Falsely called the Great Tribulation, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. You see how that works? One step in the wrong direction. All we can say, rapture. Now we can call that time period the, time, uh, the Great Tribulation. So we have pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. I don't believe in any of those. Why? Because that the tribulation, the great tribulation, is not a title for that seven-year time period. That Satan weaseling his way into the body of Christ, trying to get you to turn your back on what God calls that time period. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Some people say Daniel's seventieth week. God has his own titles. God has his own word. Yet for some reason we keep straying from it. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Rapture's not in the Bible, so I can't go off the Bible for rapture. Okay. You can't go off of it. So what do we do? I have to resort to the world's definition of what rapture is. Because I can't check the Bible, because the Bible, for those who are newly saved, babes in Christ, when you do word studies, oftentimes, somewhere in the Bible, whether it's the first time it's mentioned, it's usually when it's the first time it's mentioned, but eventually when a word is mentioned in the Bible, it's followed by a description of that word. And you get an idea of what that word means. So when we do word studies, I'll write down definitions from the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, but I keep my eye open for the Bible definition. That's the whole point. We're trying to get the context. Rightly dividing, 2 Timothy 2.15. I try to get the definition that the Bible uses. So I can't go off the Bible for rapture because rapture's not in the Bible. So what do we have to do? we got to go to the world. 
you know, Christmas, we'd have to go to the world. Some brethren are just so... I, 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 they're not crazy, they're fleshly. They're very fleshly. That they refuse to go to the world for the definition of Christmas and, and the foundation of Christmas, they try to pervert the scriptures to justify it. It's not in the scriptures, so we have to go to the world and whoever came up with the term. They try to say, Trinity, it's a title for God, it's God, it's God. Who came up with the term? I heard Peter Ruppin once say that the Trinity, they say the Trinity is Catholic, that's just garbage. Well, it's not the Bible. It's not godly. So if it's not here, where did you get it? See, I can't help Peter Ruckman. He's with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in heaven right now. He knows better now. He knows better. Okay? But brothers and Christ, be careful. The Bible building is one of the biggest places where this happens a lot, where you can add to God's Word and subtract to God's words, where you can hold traditions of men, culture, church, father, above the Word of God, and it happens on a daily basis there. Those places have gotten so perverted where they don't stick 100% to the Word of God. They go off of traditions of men, church fathers. Okay? Now, I'm not attacking Peter Ruckman. Like I just said, he's in heaven right now. He knows better. Okay? But there are brethren that this isn't their final authority, even though they say this is their final authority. They're not 100%, what I call 100% Bible believers. And remember, I'll say it again. What's 100% Bible believer? Someone that when they get showed that what they're saying isn't in the Bible, they get rid of it. The Bible says to do something they're not doing, they do it. They might not have been doing it before, but once they get there, they're ignorant. Now they know the truth, they do it. Right? Pray without ceasing. I haven't been praying every day. You're supposed to be praying every day. Okay? You're supposed to be reading God's Word every day. Start your day with God's Word. End your day with God's Word. Okay? Be not drunken. Abstain from all appearance of evil. All these things. When you first get saved, you're not going to know all this stuff. But the moment God shows you as a Bible believer, someone who believes in God's Word, God's Word comes first in their life. Not pleasing others. Not the flesh. Not the world. And definitely not Satan, the three enemies. But pleasing God comes first. What pleases God? Keeping his commandments, keeping his word. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. When you have great, The only time you're going to have great fellowship with the Lord is if you line up with this book. If you're not lining up with this book, you're not going to have good fellowship with the Lord. It's just that simple. All right. So rapture, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary Rapture, okay, it says a seizing by violence. It's violence, okay? I'm a fisherman, as far as on the coast, and one of the big things they like to sell, they like to sell these miniature bats, okay? And what it is is when you get a fish out, and if you end up dropping them, or you can't get them off the hook because they're just going too crazy, you take the back and you smack them a few times to knock them silly, and then you're able to take them off the hook. If they're flopping on the deck because they fell down, you hit them with that bat a few times, they lay still, you can reach in with your thumb with the mouth, grab it, and okay, you got your fish. Okay? They use violence to settle that fish down so they can take it up. Okay? A seizing by violence. And I've always said this. When the cash in the way happens, does the Bible say that's what's going to happen? That we're going to try to fight God and say we don't want to go. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But that's the definition. Uh, two, transport. Well, that sounds right. Transport. Ecstasy. Violence of a pleasing passion. Extreme joy or pleasure. That comes from violence. Of a please, but it's, vi it's not just bad, but it's violence of a pleasing nature. Okay, a lot of uh, things you can say about that, but it's very perverted. Okay, Ver uh, definition number three: rapidly with violence. There it is, violence again. A hurrying along with velocity, as rolling with torrent rapture. Violence is involved. As we get into the scriptures, we're going to find out when we get caught up, there is no violence involved. We're not trying to fight God when it comes to coming home. We want to come home. 
I'll go ahead and do that. When God calls my name, I'm not going to be running around here saying, I'm not ready, Lord, don't. There's going to be some that might, but I'm not going to be running around saying, don't touch me, Lord, I don't want to go, don't touch me, Lord. Stay away from me, Lord. I'm, I want to stay down here, Lord. I want to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. I want to go through your wrath being poured out on the world for seven years. I want to go through a time period where there's a different gospel that's very hard to keep. I, I just... Uh, do you really think I'm going to do that? Lord, I'm, bring me home, Lord. A lot of us brothers and Christ today are praying, Lord, I'm, can we come home? Is it time yet? The world's getting so bad. The body of Christ, we're going to be talking about this, the falling away. Everything's getting so horrible. I, don't, I can't think of a way to bring the brethren back together. Lord, I don't know how to bring the brethren back together as a whole. To get us fighting together, to get us striving together, to get us to be on the same page. Everyone's on their own page. Everyone's part of their own little club, my own little group. I love him. I love that. Everyone's so split. The body of Christ is so divided today. And I look at the Lord and said, the only thing I can think of is the catching away to unite us. Catch your ways, the only way it's going to unite us. Those who have fallen and those who are still standing. To bring us together. The Bible says we're supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment, striving together. One of the worst teachings that really came into the, to the body of Christ, that really perverted the body of Christ and separated the body, scattered the body of Christ, is the false teachings. There's things that we can agree to disagree on. When it comes to the scriptures, the Bible says all scriptures given by inspiration is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now those four areas, we're all supposed to be on the same page. We're not supposed to be disagreeing on any one of those areas. We're all supposed to be on the same page. But there's this big movement in the battle building system that, hey, that we, we're not all going to agree. We're not all going to agree. We all should. Why don't they say that? We all should agree. We should all be on the same page. They never say that. They always say, well, we're not all going to agree on everything. And, you know, that we can agree to disagree. But you say chapter and verse, it's not there. It's not there. Nowhere in Scripture does it say we can agree to disagree when it comes to those four things. That basically sums up the Word of God, period. When it comes to this book, we're all supposed to be on the same page. We're supposed to be on the same, have the same foundation, the Word of God. So we see the definition number three has violence. One has violence. Definition two has violence. Definition three has violence. Definition four, enthusiasm, uncommon heat of imagination. Uh, no, that's not what it is either. Okay. Heat of imagination. Wow. So this is the definition of rapture, and you still have brethren after being told the definition of rapture. You still have brethren using rapture. So if you turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, we're going to read. What does the Bible say? Okay. Why is rapture to no profit? Because it's a step in the wrong direction and trying to tell people it's okay to add to God's word and subtract from God's word. How many people, I mean, seriously, brothers, says Christ, in the Babel building system, online, that they're preaching truth. How many of them actually use the real term that God called, chose? The real word with the true definition that God chose? Hardly any of them. They've all gone over to saying rapture, 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 rapture. That's all they want to say. Same thing with Trinity. Very few people say Trinity, also known as the Godhead. They always just say Trinity. They've gotten away from Godhead completely, and they just say Trinity. I put out a video showing a man in a battle building that he actually separates it and says the Godhead is not the Trinity. They're both truth, but the Godhead just means Jesus has the qualities of God. Okay, And then we have the Trinity. They're two separate things. Now they're getting to separating them. It started out with Godhead. Then Godhead or Trinity. Sometimes, sometimes called the Trinity. Then over the time it became Godhead or the Trinity also known as the Trinity. Then they switched it around. Trinity, also known as the Godhead. Then they said Trinity, sometimes called the Godhead. You see what's going on here, brother says Christ. Then they drop Godhead altogether and it's just Trinity. Just Trinity. When you add to God's Word, it's, there's deception behind it. And this didn't happen overnight. The word rapture getting brought into the body of Christ didn't happen overnight. Same thing with Trinity. Same thing with a lot of things. Christmas. There's a lot of brethren in the past that would have nothing to do with Christmas. I'm talking about saints of the past. I'm talking about way past. 
like 300 A.D., 400 A.D., would have nothing to do with Christmas or Easter. They're both pagan holidays from the Catholic Church, Roman Catholicism. The Roman, um, before it became the Catholic Church, had their pagan days, summer solstice, winter solstice. They became Catholicism. They became Christmas, Easter. Okay? Some even say um, Mystery Babylon, where you have Tammuz, uh, Samaramis, Nimrod, that it's Nimrod's birthday. And what they worship Nimrod as? A sun god. Okay? But regardless, our, our attitude is supposed to be this, brother, says Christ, chapter and verse. If you can't produce chapter and verse, you're wrong. It's that simple. All raptures in the Bible, chapter and verse. And they'll read this passage saying, see there, that's how, when the Bible talks about God shall send them strong delusion, that's how I feel like I'm dealing with these people that are strongly deluded, brothers and sisters of Christ. Because they'll read what we're about to read here and say, you see there, that's, rap that's a rapture. And we're sitting there going, you're missing the whole point. Where does it actually say rapture? No, no, it's there, it's there. And it's like you're, you're talking one ear out the other. You're talking to someone that's like, there's no hope. I'm going to keep playing scenes, and I'm going to keep defending the Word of God. I pray you do too, brothers and Christ. But with some of these people, it's like, is there any hope for them? Trinity, I can show you where the Trinity is at in the Bible. There are people that will tell you, they can show you where Trinity is at in the King James Bible. And we say, okay, I'm, okay, show me. And they'll read passages that defend the Godhead of the King James Bible and say, see, there's Trinity. And it's like, but it doesn't say Trinity. You still have failed to show us where capital T Trinity is a title for God or lowercase Trinity is a description of God in the Bible. Chapter and verse. But they're so deluded, they'll say, I just showed you. And if you don't see it, their pride, their puffed upness, ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. They have the yea hath God said, it's my authority, it's my word. And they get all puffed up. I showed you, and if you don't want to see it, then you don't want to see it. Uh, I do want truth, but it's not there. Rapture, see this verse we're going to read? This is where it's, the rapture's there. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, that we're just going to read this one, but there's two uh, uh, telling of this event. Okay. This has to do with the dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay? Caught up. See, that's what the Bible chose to use. And people, like I said, they'll, they're so deluded, they'll read this and say, that's rapture. That's rapture. It's like, but it doesn't say rapture. I don't care. I love the word rapture. They're going off battle buildings. They're going, like I said, they're not being driven by the Holy Spirit and putting God in His Word first. They're being driven by, please, uh, um, that the Bible calls, I keep saying cult atmosphere, but the Bible says respecter of persons. Okay? They're trying to be of this one. I'm of this group and I'm of that group. And that group says rapture, therefore I have to say rapture. And I want to fight for something. A lot of them have this heartfelt desire. I want to fight for God. I want to fight for God. But when you fight for the word rapture, you're not fighting for God, you're fighting for the world. You're fighting for Satan. The Bible's very clear. There's people that think they do God's service. They kill you thinking they do God's service. There's brethren, I'm standing for the word of God. Chapter and verse. You're not standing for the word of God. You're not fighting for the word of God. You might have a heartfelt desire and love of God to want to fight for him. But just stand for his word. That's all you have to do. But this is Christ. That's what I'm trying to push. That's all you have to do. It says caught up. And I'll give you, like I said, we'll talk about what it means to be caught up. Okay. But here's how we know it's not a rapture. What does verse 18 say? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's a comfort. It's a good thing. It's a joyous thing. There's no violence involved. When God says, come up hither, we get new bodies. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm getting sick and tired of this body of flesh. We get new bodies, and we get caught up. Praise the Lord. There's no violence involved. It's a big scene. Mm -hmm. right? Because the other verse talks about, in a moment, a twinkle of an eye. 
And what that's talking about is not the catching up is a moment in the twinkle of an eye, because that was a big thing that you see on these left behind videos where the body just disappears and the clothes get left behind because they want to leave something there to show that somebody was there. Okay? Um, because the Bible doesn't say clothes get left behind. The Bible doesn't say blood gets left behind. Okay? We are changed. This body right here gets changed. My clothes get changed. My body gets changed. My blood gets changed. I get a whole new body. That's what happens in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Then the catching away itself takes time. It's going to be a big event. The whole world's going to see it. I mean, all the saints going back to... Um, Peter and Paul, all the saints of 2,000 years, saved sinners, are rising. The dead in Christ rise first, and then they go up. But it says here, comfort one another. It's a comfort. Violence isn't a comfort, brother, sister, Christ. It's never a comfort. So why use the word rapture? Now, real quick, caught up, caught up. I always tell this, this is what's going on, and we're going to talk about this. We're going to turn to some scriptures. Um, why it's, it's a good thing, okay? Imagine there's a pit there, and you're walking towards that pit, and you didn't notice a rock, and you trip on a rock. There's an event, catching away the body of Christ. And there's the pit, the time of Jacob's trouble. And God goes, you're about to fall into that pit. I'm going to start the time of Jacob's trouble, the church of God, the body of Christ, okay, it doesn't go into that time period. So what am I going to do? I'm going to catch you because you're about to fall into it. It's going to start. You're about to fall into it. That's what catching means. When someone's about to fall, you do what? You catch them. The body of Christ is about to fall into the pit. And God goes, no, you're not going into that time period. And he catches us and brings us up. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Caught up. Okay, and I'll, we'll talk about what God's uh, protecting us from, from the time of Jacob's trouble here in a second. But turn to 2 Corinthians 12. There's another time that Paul uses the word caught up. Okay. You know how God will say things two to three times? Why? Because those things are established. Remember in the Old Testament when he gave uh, Pharaoh the dream twice? He would give people, he gave Joseph the dream twice? Why? Because this thing is established by God. That's what Joseph told Pharaoh. The reason God gave you this twice is because this is established by God. This is absolute truth. This isn't just a coincidence. This isn't just some kind of fluke. Okay, so is caught up used again for the same situation, that God's catching people up. Yeah, let's turn to 2 Corinthians 12.1. 2 Corinthians 12.1. It is not expedient me for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Caught up. We got caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Here we see it here. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Now, this is talking about in death. The soul gets caught up. That's why I always talk about that, brother. says, if I get caught up in death, the soul gets caught up. Or in life, the catching away of the body of Christ, which we just read there. I'm going to get caught up one way or another eventually. Okay? I'm still looking for that blessed hope every day, as if God could call me home today. Caught up. Okay? And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise. Once again, how many of us want to stay down here? Raise your hands. You see how wicked things are. I know you have loved ones. I know you want to lead people to Christ. There's some brethren that have a passion to lead people to Christ. We all should be doing it. The ministry of reconciliation. But if God says it's time to come home, how many of us want to come home? Raise your hands. I'd raise both hands. I want to come home. 
he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now look at Paul. What does he say about this kind of man? Of such a one will I glory. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Of such a one I will glory, but in my... Let's see. As such one I will glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. It reminds us that this isn't it. This isn't my final destination. This isn't my home. I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You know what an ambassador is? He's someone who goes to a foreign land to speak for who he's speaking for. We are in a foreign land, supposed to be living for Jesus Christ, and we're supposed to be witnessing for Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors. Okay? This isn't our home. That's why Paul's saying he's glorying in his infirmities. This isn't our home. My eyes are on that. On heaven. The Bible even says, Paul says, we need to mind heavenly things and not get too distracted by worldly things. We're supposed to be earning rewards in heaven, not fighting for our rewards down here, living our dream life down here. Okay, getting what we want down here. We're supposed to be focused on heaven. We're supposed to be focused on that final destination. Okay, if you're driving somewhere, you're looking where you're going. Where are we going, brothers and sisters Christ? We're going to heaven. But a lot of people get distracted down here. But he says, of such a one I will glory, yet myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. It's a good thing. Getting caught up is a good thing. Why? Because we're not supposed to be going into that seven-year time period. Someday we're going to get a new body that will not tempt us anymore. Will not try to pull us to the left or to the right. Not try to, get us, not try to come between us and God. How many times have you fallen to the left or the right because of the lust of the flesh, brother says Christ? You've given in to the lust of the flesh. He did that whispers. You know how you fight the whispers? You sing hymns. You quote scripture from memory. That's why you're hiding God's word in your heart. You hide God's word in your heart. That's how you put the flesh down and you live according to this book. But that doesn't mean every once in a while those whispers don't still keep coming back every once in a while. How many times have you fallen to the right? How many times have you fallen to the left? How many times has the lust of the flesh, the temptations of the world, and to please the world, and Satan, always trying to destroy you and your walk with the Lord, put a wall between you and the Lord? How many times, brothers? How many times you? How how many of us are just sick and tired of this body of flesh? We're looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. That's what we're supposed to be looking for. But what is this? Like I said, you're walking, you trip. There's a, an event, okay? And God goes, oh, the church is not going into that hole. The church is not going into that time of Jacob's trouble. He's being caught up. Why? Okay. Turn to First Thessalonians five. 1 Thessalonians 5, brothers of Christ. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. We've done a study on the armor of God when it comes to the helmet. There's people trying to get you to take your helmet off. They're trying to steal your crown. You're supposed to have that hope of salvation. You're supposed to be looking, present tense, in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's going to call us home. Okay. The hope of salvation. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. God will chastise us. God will smack us around to get us back in the right place. He'll punish us to get us back in the right place. When we fall to the left, when we fall to the right, when there's walls that come between us and Him, He'll break those walls down through chastisement and punishment. But we're not appointed to God's wrath. Okay? For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we are saved by God's grace through faith, and the knot of works is the gift of God. It's, it's lest any man should boast. I hope I didn't get that wrong. It's Ephesians two eight and nine. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
And verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that have before been ordained that we should walk in them. It's guaranteed there's going to be a changed life. If you truly got saved, you're going to start taking this book, you're going to hide it in your heart, and you're going to start living it. And in doing so, you're going to be set apart from this world. But here, it's Jesus Christ. The gospel is repent. Okay? Repent. Repentance towards God. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, repent is having godly sorrow in your heart for your personal sins towards Him. It's not that we're all sinners. Remember what the Bible says, um, for all sin comes short of the glory of God. That's true. But you don't come to God saying, well, everybody's a sinner. No, you come to God personally, one-on-one. -on -one. I'm a sinner. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. And you're not saying a stating a fact. You have sorrow in your heart. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. My way's wrong. Your way's right. And you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You give your old, uh, the old man and you throw it at the foot of the, G of the cross. The old man's dead and buried with Jesus Christ. The new man is raised. You confess both in prayer and you ask God to save you. It's through Jesus Christ. And just Jesus Christ. There's no works. Remember that. It says here, For God not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to endure to the end to be saved. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The time of Jacob's trouble, you have to endure to the end to be saved. We don't. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. Someone in the time of Jacob's trouble, they're not sealed into the day of redemption. What's God trying to protect us from? That time of Jacob's trouble. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, dead in Christ shall rise first. We shall live together with him. Those that are asleep, we shall live together with him. Sometimes they say sleep are those that are falling away. They're acting like they're dead and trespasses and sin again, even though they're saved. They're sealed into their day of redemption. But you have brethren that fall away, and they're acting like they're sleeping when it comes to the lost world. That's why the Bible says there's fools, lost people, and there's people acting like foolish Acting like fools. You can have saved people that start going back to looking like the world, acting like the world, and laughing at the world's jokes. Okay? The Bible says God knows them that are His. In God's house, there is silver, gold, wood, and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. Which one are you, brother, says Christ? Are you to honor? Holding this word, this above, anything in this world? Traditions of men, culture, heritage, the flesh, lusts of the flesh, worldliness. Are you starting to fall into putting this down and elevating everything else? Okay. For, we, for we should live together with Him. We're not appointed to God's wrath. We're not appointed to God's wrath. Okay, turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. This is all Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. First, uh, we're going to read the whole thing. Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together unto him, by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. But no, 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 the rapture is violent. This says, not shouldn't shaken in mind and not be troubled. Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. I read this and it just, you had brethren that they had study. I had a brother in Christ, a mentor, that had study after study after study on the eminent return of Jesus Christ. Here's another verse for it. They believe that the day of Christ is at hand. This was written over 2,000 years ago. And they believe the day of Christ is at hand. They're looking every day for that blessed hope. They're looking for the coming of Jesus Christ every day with the life that they're living. But they're keeping their eye out. And he turned his back on the end of the return of Jesus Christ like that. Why? Worldliness. There was things down here that were more important than up there. Keeping their eye on Jesus Christ. All right. But there's another great verse with the day of Christ is at hand. Oh, Paul, Paul didn't believe that. Paul didn't believe that, even though he said it. Verse 3, 
Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. We're, ha we're right now in the falling away. The, the catch away of the body of Christ is just around the corner, brother, says Christ. Remember the Bible said that the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be like Sodom and Egypt. Not Sodom and Gomorrah. I've heard some people say it's like Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible doesn't say that. It says Sodom and Egypt. And right now, the big push, the right now, the big push that I'm seeing when I'm looking at news and comments people are making is that America is Mystery Babylon. They're really trying to push that. Why? Because sodomy is out of control in America. And America is so diverse. And it's got so many different religions, so many different gods. That's what Egypt's known for. Egypt is a type of the world, but Egypt's also known for they had a god for everything. A god of the river, a god of the rain, a god of the sun, you know, a god of the winter, you know. They had a god of everything, god of the trees, god of the birds. They had like a god for everything. And they're trying to push that America is, is Mystery Babylon, but you look at this world, the whole world's that way. Sodom is out of control everywhere. It is like Sodom. We're getting there. And Egypt, the false gods are everywhere. Remember, we know better. There's only two gods. There's only one capital G God, one true God, the Father. And then there's, G, there's Satan posing as, a, as God, because he's trying to do everything he can to be like Jesus Christ, to be like God. And even though it says God's plural, and there's all these like false gods, it all goes back to wor the world he worships Satan. There's only two choices, brothers and Christ. You can choose God Almighty through Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of God, or you can choose Satan in the world. You can't have both. There's only two choices. There's not 50 million choices, but it's like Sodom and Egypt today, isn't it? Hardcore out there. Okay? And what we're in, we're in the falling away. The catch away the body of Christ can happen any day now. Any day now. God could, God could, as long as suffering, God could tarry. He can wait. I'm not saying God has to come today. I wish, I love to see him come today. I, the Bible says those who love his appearing, and then you have those who turn their back on it. They don't love his appearing. I'd love to see him come back today. I'm looking for it with the life that I'm living. But he might tarry. But right now, what we're seeing more than anything is that falling away before the man of sin gets revealed. And when the man of sin gets revealed, it's after we get caught up. How do we know that? Keep reading. Uh, verse 3, we'll go back to verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Like I said, he's the lowercase g God singular of this world. And he poses in so many different false gods. Mm -hmm. Or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? <coughs> Here we go. <coughs> Excuse me. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Not our time, His time. We are now in the time, the Bible calls the time of, of the Gentiles. Jesus himself said the time of the Gentiles. They, they try to say it's the church age, but the Bible doesn't say church age. It says time of the Gentiles. Okay, what that means is, is when Jesus was, was preaching in his earth, uh, earthly ministry, he was preaching to the Jews only. He told his disciples, go not in the way of the Gentiles. He was pre preaching, uh, repent. And be baptized for the mission of, remission of sins, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, where he's going to come in as their king. That was the gospel that was being preached in Jesus' earthly ministry. And then towards the end, Jesus is going to get crucified. And he tells his disciples, the time of the Gentiles is going to come in. What does that mean? Salvation went out to the world. It was no longer of the Jews. He says salvation is of the Jews. For we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But today, salvation has gone out to the world. That's what it means to be in the time of the Gentiles. It doesn't mean only Gentiles can get saved. It means everyone can get saved. Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. and, we, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. 
For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What is this? The body of Christ. We just read, how do we get saved? And I told, I just verbally told the gospel, we get saved through repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you. We come to God broken on His terms. And the Psalms, it says that God will only save those that are broken and of a contrite spirit. Okay? We come to Him broken and put our faith in Jesus Christ. God manifests in the flesh. God the Father manifests in the flesh. The blood that was shed on the cross is God the Father's blood. The Bible says, Purchase, uh, feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And then it talks about how you were bought with a price. Know ye not that you're not your own, you're bought with a price? You belong to God now. He purchased you with his blood. That's our salvation today. There are no works involved. Okay, We're the ones hindering that time period from coming. And we'll explain why in the next set of scriptures. Why? Because salvation is not the same in that time period. It's a different gospel. Paul said, for today, if anybody preach another gospel today, including a heaven, an angel from heaven, today, if anybody preach another gospel, let them be accursed. When the body of Christ leaves, it's a new dispensation. An angel comes and preaches another gospel. The gospel for the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not the same gospel as for today. Let's keep reading here. How far do we want to go to? Keep going. To be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. He's pouring out his wrath in the time of Jacob's trouble. God is pouring out his wrath. God Almighty is opening the seals and the vials and unleashing his wrath on this world. And the first thing he does to unleash his wrath is he unleashes the Antichrist. The man of, it's called the man of sin, the son of perdition. He is an Antichrist. He's the ultimate Antichrist. But the Bible says, calls him the man of sin, the son of perdition. Okay. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. He comes down with that 200 million man army, opens his mouth, the sword comes out, and he wipes out the 200 million man army. Whew. Wipes him out completely. Okay. What's God's word likened to? A double-edged sword? Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The Bible talks about we'll have two, the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. There's going to be two witnesses, and they're going to be performing miracles. But so will Satan to deceive people. Absolutely. Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Like I said, this is talking about those in the time of Jacob's trouble. But today, does it seem like sometimes we're dealing with people with strong delusions today? Yeah. Okay. But this is for the time of Jacob's trouble. They're all going to believe that what they're doing is right. They're all going to get, they're going to take the mark, they're going to worship the beast, and they're going to be de deceived. Satan's on Jesus, and they're all going to be deceived. Verse 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Remember what that time period's called. Uh, the um, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble, but it's also said that time will be like Sodom and Egypt. You know another thing about Egypt? It's a type of the world. It's all about lasciviousness. It's about the flesh. All their different things, how they worship this God, how they worship that God, how they worship the, all their lowercase g gods galore, there's a lot of flesh involved. You know? Parties, uh, festivals. What do you think the summer solstice and the winter solstice is? It's a festival. It's time to elevate the flesh and feed the flesh. It's fun time while we're worshiping these lowercase g gods. That they all be, might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure and unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always. But we, wait a minute, wait a minute. People believe that we go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Paul just separated us from this time period. He just separated us from those going through this time period. 
But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, capital S Spirit, and belief of the truth. I'm washed in His blood. There are no works. I'm washed in His blood. I'm not appointed to His wrath. I'm washed in His blood. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. My faith is in Jesus Christ. Not my own works. Not things that were built with man's hands. My faith is in Jesus Christ. Is your faith in Jesus Christ? Are you sealed, brother, says Christ, until the day of redemption, the catching away of the body of Christ, caught up? Okay. Verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel, our gospel. Remember, Paul says the gospel is revealed to him for the, for the time of the Gentiles. When the gospel goes out to the whole world, the whole world can get saved today, Jew or Gentile. It's revealed to Paul. It's not the same gospel Jesus was preaching. In the early book of Acts, we call it a transition book because in the early book of Acts, they were preaching the gospel that Jesus and John the Baptist were preaching in the Old Testament. They're preaching the kingdom of heaven, that physical kingdom, trying to get the Jews to repent on crucifying their king and hoping that their king would come back. But then God said, hey, they don't want anything to do with me. Paul, I'm going to t show you the gospel. Peter, he has the, the curtains come down with all the unclean animals. And Peter's like, I, haven't, I don't need anything that's common, Lord. And he said, what I've made clean, call not thou common. And he tells Peter, go to this Gentile's home and preach the gospel to him. Here's the, new, here's the actual gospel for the time of the Gentiles. Go preach it to him. And he did. Salvation went out to the world. By our gospel. But it's not the same. We're going to read. It's not the same gospel as the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. He separates and does a distinction between the two time periods. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to obtain of, obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which we have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation, we're sealed into the day of redemption, and a good hope through grace, that blessed hope that he's going to call us home someday. And we're not going to be going through this time period that he's talking about. That's our hope. Okay. And look at this. Good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, word and work. Your work and your words need to line up, brother, sister Christ. If someone's talk doesn't line up with their walk, their walk is what tells the truth. It tells on them. When you back a lot of people in the corner because their walk doesn't line up with their talk, their talk changes and starts to line up with their walk. But your walk and your talk are supposed to be together. But it also says comfort yourself. It's a comfort. Going into the time of Jacob's trouble is not a comfort. For those of us who have read Revelation, who have read what's going on, it's not a comfort to go through that time period. Yet Paul keeps saying, comfort yourself with these words. He separates us. We're not the ones going into that time period. Why? Turn to Revelation 14.9. Turn to Revelation 14.9. It's a comfort. It's not violence. You know why they like to use the word rapture? Because then they can say the, the catching away doesn't happen until in the middle of the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because the time of Jacob's trouble is violent. Think about that, brothers and Christ. The time of Jacob's trouble is very violent. God is unleashing his wrath. He's opening the vials. He's opening the seals. He's pouring his wrath. It's a violent time period. So if we change the word from caught up to rapture, now we can push the rapture back into the, that caught up. We can push it back into the time of Jacob's trouble. Ooh, ah. See how that trickery works and that deception works? Because turn to Revelation 14, 9. Revelation 14, verse 9. Number one, I don't have the verse down, but where Paul said, if, any, if an angel or anyone teaches another gospel, let him be accursed. Here's an angel, and he's going to be preaching another gospel. And he's not accursed. Why? Because we're no longer in the time of the Gentiles. 
when we go into that when that time period, time it's the time of Jacob's trouble. God goes back to dealing with the Israel and the Jewish nation. It's not the time of the Gentiles anymore. In the time of the Gentiles, if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed, even if it's an angel. Paul was worried because in the time of the Gentiles, guess what goes on a lot? People are preaching another gospel, which we have not preached, he says. They're getting people to, they're preaching another Jesus, which we have not preached, an antichrist posing as Jesus. And he says that they're getting them to receive another gospel, which we have not received. A Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, gospel, Jesus, they're getting them to receive a spirit that we haven't received. And you go to the book of 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, I think it's in 1st John, where he talks about that antichrist spirit is even in the world today. It's an antichrist spirit. It's a counterfeit of the real thing. But you get to that time of Jacob's trouble, there's an actual new gospel. And it's being preached by an angel. Oh boy, that's how we know this time period is not for us. Verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man, any man... Do you see what they do? you got to be careful, brothers and Christ. When people come in with good words and fair speeches, they're deceiving the hearts of the simple. The simple are those who don't know this book. Why do you think, brothers and Christ, those of us men in ministry that love the Lord, love the Word, and truly love you, keep telling you that this is the final authority, and you need to know this book like you should know this book? You need to be taking this book and hide it in your heart. Why? Because when a servant of Satan, a wolf in sheep's clothing, comes along and tries to get you with good words and fair speeches, they don't deceive you because I'm not simple anymore. God got me to hide his word in my heart. God opened his word to me. If any man take the mark, well, no Christian would truly take the mark. Where does it say that in the scripture? It's not there. If any man take the mark... And they sat there and they act like, you remember, let's go back to Jesus. Remember Jesus where he taught, does that uh, parable? I believe it was real, but it's a parable about the publican and the Pharisee. I'm not as other men are. And he goes through all these sins and he says, and this publican. When they sit there and say no true Christian would take the mark of this sin, what they're saying is, is a Christian can be sinlessly perfect. And you look at them and you ask them, are you telling me you're sinless? And some believe it. They're strong delusion. Mentally ill. Strong delusion. Some actually push this. They're sinlessly perfect. To this day, you don't, you don't fail the Lord. You don't fall to the left. You don't fall to the right. You don't stumble and fall flat on your face. You don't let things come before you, uh, like a wall come before you and the Lord. The flesh, the world, Satan, the three enemies. You never fail God. You never sin against God as a saved sinner. And if they're honest, they have to say yes. So you can't say no Christian would ever take the mark of the beast, because that's like saying no Christian after they get saved would ever sin again. How many of us have failed the Lord, brothers of Christ? Especially right out the gate. How many of us who are newly saved struggled with the flesh, and it took years for God to clean up our life and get us to where we are right now? It's a process. Okay? I'm not perfect. I'm a saved sinner. Brother says, Christ, are you a saved sinner? Right? If any man take the mark, say, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, if any man, that's anyone. Brothers, we just read that there's a falling away before that time period, that the, day, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. We're having a falling away today. You have people falling away to uh, uh, doctrines of devils. False doctrine. You have people trying to pervert liberty to try to justify sin. Brethren fall on the way to that. They're trying to use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. You have them uh, turning on this book as God's perfect written word. They start out the gate strong. This is God's perfect written word. And over the years, they fall away. Eternal security. Dispensational teaching. Pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, which includes looking, present tense, for that blessed hope. The imminent return of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It goes hand in hand. You turn your back on one, you're turning your back on the other. Don't let any man deceive you with good words and fair speeches. Because they're getting into the world. We see a falling away today, brother says Christ. And you're telling me no Christian today would take the mark? We just had something, brother says Christ, that just came out. Okay, 
And I know there's brethren that took it. And I can't say it because YouTube will censor me. But there's just something you had to take. And there's brethren that are like, we're warning you, you shouldn't be taking it. It's not good for you. How many actually took it that were saved? I believe there were saved people that took it. Oh, no, no, no saved person would ever take that. And some of you know, I, like I said, I can't mention it here because I'll get censored. Okay. But you know, if you've known what's going on in America and across the world for the last couple of years, you might know what I'm talking about. But no, no saved person would ever take that. There were saved people that took it. And now they regret it. Now they're crying to the Lord, Lord, please forgive me. I shouldn't have taken that. And I believe the Lord's forgiven them. There still might be some physical consequences. Remember, the cost of sin, though, if you live after the flesh, you, you shall die. There's still physical consequences to sin down here. We're still under the law of sin. We're just not under the law of sin and death. That's where the sealed comes in. Death gets dropped and the seal comes in. I'm now sealed. I'm going to heaven when I die. You're going to heaven if you're truly saved and born again, brother, sister Christ, when you die. But to say that no man would take this mark and worship the beast? And this time period... Food is scarce. We're seeing it in the world today, brother, says Christ, the uh, worldwide famine. Okay, people are looking for that worldwide famine. I'm not. That worldwide famine, there's famines that happen in countries all over the world in different parts of the year. There's famines, absolutely. I'm not saying there's no famines. But we're talking about a worldwide famine where everyone's desperate for food. The whole world is desperate for food. That's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm looking for that blessed hope. Not the time of Jacob's trouble. But we can see some steps that are leading up to that worldwide famine. Okay? And um, the economic collapse. The worldwide economic collapse. Not just a country going bankruptcy. I'm talking worldwide economic collapse will not happen until the time of Jacob's trouble. But they're trying to make it out like it's, gonna, it's there's people looking for it today. You're not supposed to be looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. We're supposed to continue fighting for the Lord, fighting for His Word, fighting for the Gospel, living a life of Christ, being a light to the world. Okay, that's what we're supposed to do. Can you store up on some food? Go for it. If, if you want to, knock yourself out. But remember your main priority. Remember who it is you serve, not this flesh. The Lord God Almighty. Okay. But we're going through hard times. Would someone take the mark and worship the beast today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why is there not a mark in the beast today? Because we're not appointed to God's wrath. And, Jesus, and Paul said that we are saved by the gospel that we're saved today. So by God's grace through faith. No works. And not of works lest any man should boast. There's no works. Let's keep reading here. 10. What happens to those that take the mark, that worship the beast in his image, and receive the mark of his, in his forehead or in his hand? What happens to these people? Verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. If you're saved, you lose your salvation. If you're lost, you cannot get saved. There is no seal unto the day of redemption in this time period. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. I'll read that again. The wrath of God. The wrath of God. We are not appointed to God's wrath. We read that for today. We're not appointed to God's wrath today. Let's see if I can get this back up here. It says, For God, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. There's no works involved. Here, you take the mark, you worship the beast in his image, you go to hell. God's wrath is upon you. Mm -hmm. God, <clears throat> the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Brimstone. Fire and brimstone. It's talking about hell and then the lake of fire. Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They're being tormented forever. 
Hell gets taught, death and hell gets tossed in the lake of fire. The lake of fire is forever. It's not annihilation. Hell is not the grave. Hell is not annihilation. It's eternal torment. Okay. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they had no rest day nor night who worshiped the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Okay. For this time period, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of our Lord and the faith of Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. In that time period, salvation changes. Okay? It would ruin that seal that God has sealed us today. We are sealed into the day of redemption. If the body of Christ today was to go into that time period, that seal would become null and void. It would become worthless. You take the mark, you worship the beast, you lose your salvation, you go to hell. In that time period, there's commandments of God, works. <coughs> today, brothers and Christ, I teach, a lot of the brethren teach, that you do good works as proof of salvation. You do good works because you are saved. But those good works didn't save you. God saved you by His grace through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. The blood that was shed on the cross. Okay. You come to Him broken. Now in this time period, you still need to come to God broken, just like today. The, the gospel as it is today. What's different then, though, but there's works added. Now that you're saved, don't take the mark, don't worship the beast. If you took the mark and you worship the beast, you can't get saved. The gospel's not for you. You can't get saved. So when I talk about this, brothers and guys, caught up. What's God saving us from? He's saving us from that time period where you can lose your salvation. Caught up. We're going to trip. We're going to fall into a pit. We're going to fall into a time where you can lose that seal. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. You can lose that seal. And God goes, uh-uh. I'm going to catch you. And I'm going to pull you up. You're not going through that time period. That's how serious it is when it comes to using the word rapture versus caught up, or the catching away. Rapture is violence involved. Time of Jacob's trouble, there's violence involved. By bringing in the word rapture to the body of Christ, they were able to deceive people into believing that the body of Christ goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, are we going to have tribulation today? Yes. Are we going to see tribulation today? Trials and tribulation? Yes. Are we going to have hard times as Christians? Could we end up losing our life for Jesus Christ? Absolutely. There's plenty of martyrs in the past. But God's not pouring his wrath out on us. In that time period, God will be pouring his wrath out on the world. And you can lose your salvation. Turn to Proverbs 36, and we'll end it with this. Proverbs 36. Ecclesiastes is what I'm in. But Proverbs 36. Let's go back to five. Brothers, you say it's not that big of a deal. Adding the word uh, rapture, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal. Every word of God is pure. Oh, messing with Jeremiah when it comes to giving us an idea of the Christmas tree. It's an idol. It's made with man's hands. doesn't matter if it's not exactly what they were doing back then, but it's still creating, changing the word of God. It's not that big of a deal. Changing the title of God, Godhead, to Trinity, it's not that big of a deal. You know what it all leads? It leads to apostasy. It leads to pulling you, brothers and sisters in Christ, away from the Lord God Almighty and His Word. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. There should be a fear of God and the men out there that are changing God's word and turning it into a lie. 
Brother and sister Christ, when you find out you were deceived, I was deceived. I came out of false religion. I was a professing Christian most of my life. Almost everything I was taught, I had to relearn the truth from the King James Bible. I wasn't taught much. Honestly, in these battle buildings, you're not really taught much. But they did say some things that they made it out like this is absolute truth, this is God's word. And I found out that was wrong. That was a lie. And I had to start conforming to the word of God. I had to start saying things God's way. I had to start doing things God's way. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Do you trust God? Then why are you changing His word? Do you trust God? He puts the, He's a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. You know what shields me? This right here. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart. Oh, there he goes again, quoting the same verses all the time. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. And above all, taking on the shield of faith that's able to quench all the fiery darts. You have the word, uh, you have the sword, which is the word of God, and you're girding up your loins with truth. You're studying it, you're fighting for it, you're living it. And you have that shield of faith that when someone comes around trying to turn you from God's pure words, you're catching all the darts with that shield. Do you trust God? Lately, I've been trying to get to brethren and say, do you trust God? When I have brethren that vehemently defend things that aren't in the Bible, I'm saying, do you trust God? Well, of course I trust Then why are you trying to correct His Word? Why are you trying to add to His Word and subtract from His Word? Do you trust God? Every word of God is pure. Verse 6, Add thou not unto His words the written word of God, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. The whole point of bringing in the word rapture was so that the lost world could, the Satan and them, could pervert the word of God and push the church of God into the time of Jacob's trouble. See, rapture has to do with violence. There's violence in the time of Jacob's trouble. God's wrath is being poured out. There is no rapture. Brothers and sisters Christ, like I said, if you keep saying it's not a big issue, you're taking a step, a dangerous, dangerous step in the wrong direction. And when you take one step, you're going to take another. And you're going to take another. You're standing, at, let's say you're standing in line with the Word of God. You lay down the book of God and you take one step. Rapture is not that big of a deal. I can say rapture. It's not. We shouldn't really be fighting. Now, I'm not fighting you. I'm standing for the Word of God. Take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. I'm going to stand for the Word of God. But this is Christ. I pray you stand for the Word of God. But they put their Bible down, and you take one step. Oh, Trinity isn't that big of a deal. Then you take another step. Holidays aren't that big of a deal. That we turn, that we turn around and try to put a Jesus stamp on it and make it Christian. Oh, Trinity, changing the title of God to Trinity, it's not that big of a deal. Adding that, like, God in three persons. Remember, the Bible teaches that the Godhead is God and the person of Jesus Christ. And we'll be doing a study on this in the future, but God is not three parts. How many of you heard people say God in three parts? That's no different than the Trinity. They still can't get away from the Trinity when they say God in three parts. God the Father is a soul. That's it. God the Father is the soul. You know who has three parts? Jesus Christ has three parts. That's why I say the Godhead is God and the person, remember person, body, soul, and spirit, person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has three parts. That's why the Bible says in Him, Jesus Christ, in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay? It's God in the person of Jesus Christ. Not God in one being. It's God in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible calls Jesus Christ a person four times. In Him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Right? But we can say God in three persons. You take another step away. Oh, we can say God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's not in the Scriptures. You take another step away. Oh we, can oh, we can change the Word of God. We can add here and subtract here. 
We can try to use that deception I told you about where they take a word and replace it with another word and they, and they act like they're just given a definition. They're not given a definition. They're replacing the word with another word. Okay? That's deception. That's a lie. They replace it with another word and then they give the definition of their new word and it makes their whole study sound right. Sound great. Right? Okay? It's another step. And another step. And another step. And the next thing you know, you turn around and you look back. Where's my Bible? It's a million miles down that direction. That's how far you've gotten away from this book. And at the same time that you're getting away from this, Satan's getting you away from this book, he's getting you into lust of the flesh. He's getting you into the world. Satan's starting to deceive you and getting you to turn your back on this book. Why? Because he got you to step away from the book. Brothers, this is Christ. Do you trust God? Those who claim to be Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, do you trust God? Is this your foundation in all matters of faith and practice? Do you actually believe what we just read there in Proverbs 36 and 5? Do you believe that every word of God is pure? So I'm going to end this, Brother Jesus Christ. Stick with the book. I'm not the final authority, Brother Jesus Christ. This is. I don't want people being respecter of persons towards me. I want this being the final authority. And I know, I know, I know with that attitude, I probably won't get that great of a following, because in these last days, men want to be followers of men that aren't Jesus Christ. Everyone has their guy that they follow, that respecter of persons. Brother Jesus Christ, I don't want you to be respecter of persons towards me. This is the final authority. I want you to elevate this above me, above your flesh, above the world, and especially above Satan. Because a lot of brethren are, are, are becoming part of the falling away. They're starting to do things Satan's way and the world's way. They're not doing things God's way. We're getting away from this book, brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to get back to the book. Hiding in our heart and living it. Do you trust God? I love you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Please, please, please. This is the final authority. Not this man right here. And not any other man that's behind the camera. Not any man that's standing behind the pulpit. This is the final authority. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, preaching truth. True love is preaching truth and standing for the truth. I want your relationship with God to be as strong as mine, stronger than mine. I want you to have a relationship that doesn't have the burdens that I do. Because I still struggle with the flesh. I have temptations. I'm, I go for walks a lot. I talk with the Lord a lot. Okay, I get in His Word a lot. Why? Because I have my temptations. We all have our faults. The Bible says we're to confess our faults one to another. We all have our faults. I want you to have a walk with the Lord that's ten times better than mine. I want you to know this book ten times more than I do. Okay? I want you and this book to be the number one. Not me. Okay? So, I love you. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My love for you, brothers and Christ. Truth. So, keep praying for me. I'm praying for you guys in these last days. Stick with the book, and I will see you in the next study.